and he was the dean of the Academy of Sciences uh, at Comstock University, Islamabad. Um, he has done some pioneering work in material sciences, nanostructures, optical electronics, and low temperature physics solidifies uh, his reputation. He has uh, four US patents, more than 1,200 1, citations. He supervised 14 PhD and 50 MS students so far. Uh, today, he'll be giving a talk on the topic of nanotechnologies quantum leap, inspiring the next generation of STEM explorers. Um, uh, we'll have 10, 15 minutes at the end um, for any question. Kindly put either your name down in the uh, chat, or you can just click um, the, the, the icon, which will raise your hand, and I'll be able to see it, OK? Uh, thank you so very much, sir, for your time today. Um, uh, over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ramla. Uh, I'm, no, no, not this one. I'm just looking which one is my presentation over here. Okay. So I'm uploading it. See, sir, we can see it. You can see it. This is yes, the, the, the same with the same title as, as you said. Uh, yes, sir, it's just the same one. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm really, uh, uh, Thankful to you and uh, Dr. Habibullah for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, well, uh, this is uh, a, an exciting area which has actually uh, come into forefront in last uh, three decades, I can say, from the start of early 90s. And it's all based on, I'm talking about nanotechnology, based on the developments which happened in in the area of semiconductor uh, device fabrication, the tools which were developed uh, to uh, have uh, faster and efficient uh, microprocessors and processing devices, uh, signal processors. Uh, these tools are being used in other area of material science, uh, chemistry, biology, uh, uh, electrical engineering, uh, you name it, wherever the processes are involved uh, to optimize the processes, uh, to get efficient uh, uh, output uh, from the systems. So my, my talk is, is a bit scattered, I can say. It's going to give a flavor where technology is taking us. And uh, what I feel from my own experience uh, since my PhD 30 years ago, that uh, Nanotechnology is bringing all the disciplines back together. Now we need uh, human resource, having uh, the knowledge of uh, physics, mathematics, uh, and biology, and then have the skill of computer science uh, to manipulate the data, to play with the data, and should be able to think in terms of designing uh, experiments, uh, uh, maybe for simulation or for real lab. So. Uh, uh, and and just to brief, uh, Dr. Amla has already given my introduction, but I was a visiting Fulbright scholar way back in 2002 uh, at the Department of Material Science and uh, Engineering uh, at uh, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, uh, a wonderful experience. And I felt that ch changed the destiny of my professional career, the year which I spent there. Uh, taught me many things, you know, how to uh, present yourself and how to work to on a project. That was uh, a, a, an exciting year which I spent over there. So let me start with, uh, and that's a definition of uh, illiterate, uh, way back given by uh, Elvin, Elvin Toffler, uh, in, in his famous book, Future Shock. And he says the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. We are, we are living in, 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 in an era where a huge amount of data is being generated every day, every hour, uh, with numerous sources of data generation. Uh, uh, and then being shared uh, between all of us, no matter scientists or social scientists or engineers, doctors or a layman. And then we we learn new things every 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 time. 
and it it should be of a capability that we should be able to accept new knowledge learn it and not let the outdated knowledge uh, control our uh, uh, processes or our uh, thought process or our uh, workings so that's very important and this is the message which i actually i give to my students as well you should always be ready to learn and to learn new things one has to unlearn and one has to have the ability to relearn to take the new knowledge now let us start when is the when was the birth of nanoscience and technology on the right side top right uh, we have this visionary physicist uh, richard finman uh, a professor at caltech uh, in his 1959 uh, talked to at the annual Con, uh, con meeting of the uh, American Physical Society. Uh, the title of the talk was There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom. And his talk gave many, many ideas. And one of the uh, few, few of those ideas were uh, ultra dense data storage, nanobots for medical applications, imaging at the nanometric, nanometric scale and gaining control over the molecular self-assembly processes. And he said, why cannot we write down all 24 volumes of Britannica on the head of a common pin uh, if we have certain tools? And that was in 1959, you know, it, is, it was a futuristic vision where technology can lead to us. And only it took uh, 30 years from there when IBM demonstrated, few scientists at IBM dem uh, demonstrated they can write by using single atom, and they wrote uh, IBM using uh, xenon atoms uh, at ultra cold temperatures. Uh, bottom right, you can see two particles moving. This is this was uh, his idea of Feynman diagrams for which he got Nobel Prize. At the bottom, there's a scale given. Uh, which which gives us the idea of uh, 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 of the things of the uh, articles of the objects in nature, starting from a human being around one meter to two meter tall, and then we're going down to apple, and finally, and you and, and look at that scale that uh, one meter from one meter to uh, one decimeter, one centimeter, a vast then a, a sand uh, uh, one millimeter uh, dimension of a sand uh, dot, and then hair around 100 diameter of a hair around 100 micro microns, blood cell a few microns, and then bacteria, viruses. We go down. We go into a scale which is into nanometers. And nanometer one nanometer is actually defined as one billionth of a meter. So if I div divide a meter. I can make it half, quarter meter, go to one tenth, and I keep on dividing, and I go divided so that one small segment becomes a one nanometer. Thus, then I am in the range where uh, where the dimensions of atoms or fewer atoms are in that range, or or a molecule, uh, some polymeric uh, polymeric molecules dimensions or length of the bonds are in nanometers. Now, for th that, in order to manipulate uh, these objects at that sm small scale, we need to have technology which can uh, either synthesize these uh, 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 molecular structures or atomic structures, or which we can either uh, synthesize or fabricate using technology. Uh, and then uh, we go to the atomic scale as well. So the nanotechnology is is the technology which deals with structures which have dimensions in a uh, few tens of nanometers or sub nanometers. Now, if I look at what is happening at at the industrial revolution revolution uh, stage, we are at the fifth cusp of the fifth uh, industrial revolution. And that is combining the artificial intelligence with the uh, uh, human machine uh, interactions. So starting from the first revolution, we have had steam power and mechanization around two year, 200 years ago. Then we went into mass production and generation of electricity. And then early and mid 
20th century, we have computers, automation, and robotics started taking place. So this, uh, the factories and the uh, big uh, manufacturing plants started using robotics. And then at the end of the last century and early this century, internet overtook and then huge data was produced, data analytics and connectivity brought the fourth industrial revolution. And in the fifth re industrial revolution, it seems that artificial intelligence is going to uh, take over. Uh, and artificial intelligence, as we see, uh, is the intelligence of the machines or the software as opposed to the intelligence of human beings or animals. So uh, no, the term artificial intelligence is uh, used because the machines can interpret data much faster and can interpret huge amount of data in, in a very short time and, and identify certain patterns uh, and make decisions based on those patterns. And that is the artificial intelligence for which, uh, and we, we already have started seeing uh, the effect of artificial intelligence where uh, YouTube, Amazon, and Netflix, they are using it in their systems uh, Google search uses uh, artificial intelligence. If you, if I keep on searching something uh, and I reopen my Google uh, uh, form and I see uh, the recommendations by the Google, uh, the understanding of human speech, uh, this is natural language processing, which, is, which uses artificial intelligence. We are having self-driving cars. A lot of effort is going into that one. Tesla has got one. Um, and, and Google is working on that one. Chat GPT is the one which I'm sure every one of us have at, at least uh, played with it or heard about it or used it at, at some level. And that uses huge amount of data and uh, uh, NPL and, uh, and uh, response to our queries. Uh, uh, using that data. Now, looking at uh, what are what 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 are the main uh, uh, parameters where, on which AI depends? The two uh, main parameters. One is the computing power, how much computing power our system has, and the second is the data. How big is the data? Uh, these two factors, two parameter parameter inputs with uh, two uh, para, uh, parameters which are required by AI. And these are very critical. Now, the computing power comes from the machine. Uh, I'll come to that one, how the computing power has affected, uh, has, uh, uh, has improved over the years. And it has direct relation to uh, the semiconductor fabrication uh, industry. Now, the components of artificial intelligence is uh, machine learning, deep learning, big data, and data science. So right now, I'm, I'm not distinguishing whether we are talking about a computer scientist or a physicist or engineer or, or a biologist. Data can be from any discipline. So artificial depends on, uh, works on the machine learning, which means if we have a structured data, then uh, the computer computers look into that data and, and make some inference uh, because there are certain models which are given uh, to the uh, which which work which has got number of parameters which which can be in uh, millions or billions of parameters to look into that one and then the machine the pro models look into certain uh, uh, patterns into that one the and then we have deep learning within this machine learning which is a subset of machine learning and deep learning is comes from uh, the non structured uh, data which we have, which which doesn't have, doesn't look to have a pattern which needs to be refined or cleaned, or validated, uh, and this is uh, this this is partially part of the data science, which I actually encompasses and encompasses all the big data uh, which we are generating either through experiment or through simulation or through some other uh, medium. So that this is these are the components where where, uh, where on which artificial intelligence depends. So if we have a data, then we need to have a computing power. 
to to look in to look go through that data and these are certain steps which are uh, given over here you can see the top layer is all dependent on the data so once we have a data and gone through different cycles of data and we have data ingestion and analysis curation which means refining and then data labeling segmenting them validating them and then preparing the final data for computer compu computation so the bottom one is then the models come into that one which plays with that uh, data and it's a very heavy computation involved which has got a very high price as well and this goes in in cycles before we get something out useful out uh, output from uh, the ai software now looking at this this slide is just to give an idea uh, the line, the blue line is, uh, uh, is the prediction. Uh, okay, let, let me say on X axis is the number of parameters, any model which, which is used by the artificial intelligence. And on the vertical axis is the flops, which is the operating uh, instructions per second over here into the days. So this is the, the vertical axis tells how many uh, computations are being done. And on the on the x axis is the number of parameters the model plays with. So uh, the which the gray uh, squares is the actual GPT models GPT three models, which uses a different number of parameters as given uh, uh, on the x axis, and then it 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 actually follows this predicted line uh, where we have beta flops. So flops is a unit of uh, uh, looking at the, uh, this is floating point uh, operations per second. Uh, computer scientists know better, but that tells the computing. Uh, and it depends on how much data a processor can handle uh, with respect to its frequency, its operational frequency. Uh, this one, the uh, NVIDIA uh, uh, estimated at 1 trillion parameters uh, this is the NVIDIA processor, artificial uh, intelligent more, uh, model working with the NVIDIA processors. And then we have GPT-4 uh, on the right, top right with 17.5 trillion parameters and 100 trillion uh, parameters to predict uh, the model uses these, look at the parameters involved in here. So at the bottom, I've, I've given some numbers which shows that if GPT-3 running with the 7.5 trillion parameters, it would take at least 450,000 petaflops days uh, and requires 7,600 GPUs, uh, GPUs, which is graphical processor units uh, for a year and would cost around 200 million. And if we go to GPT-4 with 100 trillion parameters, it would require around 83,000 GPUs running for a year and the cost would be two, 2 billion. So the purpose of showing that uh, with increased uh, computing power is the increased uh, financial resources, the, those are required. This slide, I will not spend much time, but it's the basic concept behind the artificial intelligence is the neural network, which is basically number of layers when different parameters are being compared and matched with each other. So uh, for an example, an input is given of uh, a president of uh, United States, George Washington, I think so. And then uh, this picture is divided into number of, uh, uh, for, for number of layers where it has to be uh, identified, find the combinations, uh, matches, patterns, identify features, and eventually the software gives you the output, but that takes uh, uh, a lot of computation in between uh, to recognize the image. Uh, this is what this is the power of uh, uh, artificial intelligence. Um, now this artificial intelligence is being used in all uh, uh, segments of life. And mostly uh, this artificial intelligence application, which is being foreseen is in healthcare, and in finance market, it it has already started taking up uh, being used in these two areas, 
then in automobiles we see uh, uh, driverless cars coming into this one or even if there are drive cars with the drivers there are certain features which are based on artificial intelligence which can guide the uh, vehicle on on the roads surveillance social media entertainment and since corona uh, education is another segment which which uh, seems to have will it will take much advantage from the artificial intelligence particularly when uh, we are we come to the systems where uh, we we want to have self learning environment for a student uh, where th there is no human interaction available but then the uh, the then the machine will guide according to the capability and the intellect of the student uh, to acquire the knowledge so all these areas agriculture e-commerce robotics are being where artificial intelligence is going to be uh, used wait so uh, let me go no i'm coming to some hardcore science uh, transistor is basically the heart of all it revolutions and i i i feel not i but all most of the technologists believe that that is the most amazing in invention of the 20th century on the bottom right uh, you see three scientists who who invented the transistor in 1940s they worked around 11 years to invent this device and they got Nobel Prize in 1947. Uh, right now, we have one chip, a microprocessor chip with more than 5 billion transistors on, on a single silicon piece. And that is what is giving the computing power to the computers. The more transistors we have, the more computation we can do. Now, transistor is a semiconductor device, which, which was initially... Uh, invented to amplify the signal. And the Bell Labs actually got these scientists to work together to, to uh, design and to invent a device which can amplify the audio signals which they were uh, uh, transmitting through their telephone networks. By that time, the rectifying device had already, already been invented and was being used so the idea was there, if, if there are materials which can rectify electrical signal, then there should be some configuration of a device which can amplify the electrical signal. So these th three gentlemen who got Nobel Prize, uh, uh, they invented transistor. Later on, it was discovered that transistor can be used as a switch. So all modern electronics is based on transistor being used as a switch where it, it is either in on state or in off on, on state or off state. So we can have zero and one, which is the base of the binary computers, motor computers. Now on, on the bottom left side, uh, this is a MOSFET metal oxide semiconductor transistor with the source. It's a three terminal device. We have a source drain. So the current comes in from source and goes out from drain. And we control the amount of current through this device, through this gate. So it's like a valve on a, on a, on a tube in which water is flowing. And we can control, control the flow of water or the volume of the water by, uh, by opening or by closing uh, the valve. And then uh, the number of transistors which we can put on, on a chip depends on the length of the gate. So this is the diff, diff distance between source and drain is defined by this length, gate length. And the smaller the gate length, the more transistors we can put uh, in, into, a, into the semiconductor chip. So if we look at uh, the fabrication processes, the Moore's law, very famous Moore's law, Gordon Moore, who, in, uh, who is the pioneer who, who founded the Intel uh, organization way back in early late 60s and early 70s, predicted that the number of transistors will be doubled every two years, 18 months to two years. Uh, and that will that is because of the advancement in technologies. So we have now already touching uh, transistors with uh, around uh, more than a billion transistors in, in there. And in, in a single chip, one square inch silicon piece has got more than a billion transistors in it 
and that gives the uh, computing power to the computers. So on the right side, I've given a scale which can tell, <clears throat> uh, show us that 1971, when first microprocessor was made, which was a four bit uh, microprocessor, it has got gate width of 10 micron. And now we anticipate in next year uh, feature, the gate length will be around two nanometer. And on the left side, uh, different technologies are being employed. I'm not going to talk about the technologies, but it's still a three terminal devices, but it can be a planar device, or it can be a vertical device, or it can be a fin device uh, with multiple arms. So these technologies are changing, but we are following this uh, Moore's law uh, with a huge number of uh, transistors in there. Now coming to the nanotechnology, so that these the transistors or fabrication we do is always a top-down uh, approach, which means we take a large bulk material and then we do some lithography, some processing, and we cut it down to smaller pieces and, uh, and then make them functional. Uh, there's another way which is given by the nature and nature is to do the self-assembly. Uh, start from a single atom, single molecule, assemble them, until they have certain functionalization. So I, I can give you an example from biology that amino acid uh, enzymes, they combine and they make proteins and there are thousands and thousands of proteins with different functionalities, but they all are made up of amino acids. So looking at uh, number of atoms, the atoms on the surface, they play a big role. So on the right side, on, on the left side, I've uh, given a graph where the radius of a, uh, a spherical uh, uh, molecule uh, material is given with the dimensions in nanometers. So what I, and on vertical scale, we have plotted surface to area, uh, surface area to volume ratio. The smaller the particle size, the larger this surface to volume ratio is, which means the large number of particles will be on the surface and smaller number of particles will be in the bulk inside the surface. So the, the characteristics of these uh, will be the physical, chemical, or biological properties of these materials will be governed by this, the surface atoms, not by the volume atoms. But if we increase the size and make it, make it huge, few hundred nanometers or thousands of nanometers, then the number of atoms in the bulk is huge, and the properties are uh, governed by the uh, bulk uh, or the volume of the atoms, not by the surface. The surfaces are very important because surfaces are the interface which interact with the outside wor world. So if we want to develop some sensors or we want to develop some uh, biological uh, diagnostic tools, we need to have surfaces, uh, active surfaces. So larger number of atoms on the surfaces can interact with the outside world and they can uh, pass on the information. Now, nanotechnology is an exciting emerging field because it combines biology, biotechnology, uh, environmental protection, ecology, e economics, ethics, IT, electronics, ma medicine, pharmacy, physics, mathematics, chemistry. So we need to have all these coming together. Uh, either we form a group where multiple discipline trained people work together, or we, we need to have people with multiple skills uh, to work in the area of nanotechnology. So that's bringing science and engineering and technology together to work, to develop uh, devices or uh, uh, structures which can be used by a human being or by, uh, by, by us, either in healthcare sector or in environmental protection or in the energy sector as well. So that's that's very important. So it's not working in silos or in isolation. Uh, so I give a little example. Uh, personalized personalized health care is, 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 an, is an area which is emerging very fast because uh, the human anatomy and not anatomy or uh, the biology, uh, the different humans uh, uh, they uh, respond differently to different medicines. So what we need to, we, we need to have devices or we need to have sensors which can detect 
uh, uh, the levels of medicine needed by a certain person. And this is what we call doctors inside your body, which means small robots or small machines, which are which move in our bloodstream like uh, red blood cells, and they identify uh, where the medicine is needed and how much medicine is needed at what time. So this is all come under the personalized healthcare systems, um, which is being uh, explored using nanotechnology. And here, both, both are important. The fabrication processes in the lab and then the self-assembled systems which can be integrated with these fabricated devices, which can be controlled remotely uh, using uh, either uh, IR or uh, uh, microwave radiation uh, uh, technologies that's, or, or magnetic uh, fields. That's very important. Uh, cancer cells are being treated uh, using nanoparticles, using uh, surface plasmon resonances. And it's a, it's a, it's a very interesting phenomenon that uh, with use particles with the surface plasmon resonances, the temperatures can be raised locally and controlled as well. So not excessive heat can be given and certain heat can be given to destroy the cancerous cells. Uh, one of the use of nanotechnology in the labs. Uh, Another one is which is coming very very which which are actually which is already there. We have all have uh, mobile cells and these mobile mobile phones and or smartphones. These are connected to the internet. At the moment, the idea is that more than fifty billion uh, mobile smartphones are connected to the internet and they are sharing data with each other. So the sensor networks, the future cities or the smart cities or the smart towns have all devices connected with each other. Uh, I can give you an example in a house uh, which is connected with the, which have the small sen uh, smart sensors installed in it, can control the temperature, uh, the ambience of the uh, ho uh, home, and it can control, it can, it can control the consumption of energy as well, uh, whether to lit on the light, or not to lift the light or to switch on the air conditioning, all these are there. And, and probably many of us have installed uh, uh, the surveillance cameras uh, in our homes and wherever we go ar around the world, we can have a look at our uh, homes uh, about the security situation and about some other situation for which we have installed. And all these are nano sensors, nano built sensors into there. Even our cameras, the mobile cell cameras have got uh, smart silicon sensors in there whose dimensions are being reduced into uh, sub-micron, into sub-micron uh, uh, regions, maybe a few hundred nanometers. So the high resolution imaging. So if we see uh, 10 megapixel or 100 megapixel, and that clearly shows the size of the pixel is going down, which has increased the resolution. So sensor networks and sensors around us, whether it's for health or for security or for agriculture, they are already there and they are being used. And they are being used because the efficiency of these sensors has been enhanced because of the use of the nanomaterials in there. Then another very important uh, direction of the nanoscience is the self-healing structures. And we get this idea from the nature. If we get some scar on our skin and we treat it, it heals by itself. So wound healing, smart delivery, uh, and then all these are the characteristic of the, so the materials are intelligent. Basically, when we want to have self-healing structures, we want to have intelligent mater uh, materials which can identify uh, any problem in their structure and they can recorrect or they can reconstruct themselves. Uh, we need uh, these materials for solar cells, for uh, environment, particularly where we detect pollution. We want these sensors to be reused once they have been used so the life can be increased if they can recycle themselves, which means they can reclaim themselves from the environment and uh, and then they can be reused and their life can be increased as well. That's another area. 
which combines chemistry, physicist, technologist, uh, and biologist to develop those materials. Uh, I want to give another example uh, is the DNA transistor, uh, which is which use which uses multiple discipline discipline trained people. It's electronic transistor, but it is used for sequencing the DNAs and nanopores are made and DNAs are uh, passes through these ones and they are they can easily be uh, sequenced uh, as we look at the potentials between the two contacts uh, 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 alongside the those nanopores and that is being used to the sequence the DNA. Now coming to the last part is uh, is the data. We need to have data to do all these things and we need to generate data. Uh, IBM predicted by 2020, we are already, already over 2020, the half life of the data will be around few hours. Every 11 to 12 hours, the data will be doubled. And this is happening right now. And this is happening because of five, four major parameters, the internet of things, with the sharing of the devices, so many devices interconnected with each other, and they share the data. We are generating data known as the big data. Uh, and whenever we do, anal do analysis, we generate more data. And that is helpful for decision making. Advancement of science and invention and technology is playing a big role uh, where we, we are uh, contributing to the generation of this data, either in the lab, or in the thought or in the, in the simulations and by doing computations. And if you look at the number of patents being uh, registered uh, every year, it, the number is going, uh, is, is really very high compared to uh, 50 years ago. And then the collaboration in science and technology, the, the internet, since the internet, the collaboration has become uh, very easy. You, one, one doesn't have to move from one place to another place to, to do the collaborations. Uh, they do the independent experiments and they share the data with each other and that generates uh, more knowledge, more data. And that's one, one important part of uh, our scientific endeavors, how to generate real data which can be used in decision making. Uh, this, this I will go very quickly. I, I will not go uh, in much detail, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm saying this thing that the future belongs to those people who can play with data. No matter it's a data coming from the social scientists or from a hardcore science scientists or from the some manufacturing industry, this data is needed to understand, to develop patterns, and make decisions. Uh, I, I think our stock exchanges and financial market is, markets already started using this uh, uh, data analysis maybe 40, 50, 60 years ago, but the importance has uh, important of uh, having a data scientist in your group, uh, in, in our groups is has been realized very, very recently now when uh, it has been realized that uh, there's a huge amount of data available. So uh, the, the Harvard Business Review, Business Review hailed data science as the sexiest job of the 21st century. And if you look at the freelancing market these days, you will find the more data scientists are needed by the companies which can play with the data and come up with uh, some uh, data which can be used for decision making. Uh, and then data scientist doesn't have to be a computer scientist, can be physicist, statistics, a statistician, a mathematician, uh, must have capability of doing coding, playing with the big data. It can be a, from the business or engineering side as well. Uh, I, I'll, I'll move to the last slide over here. I'm a physicist, so I just compared but that is equally good for all uh, physicists and um, chemists or biologists or engineer. So we do we collect data by doing our experiments. Uh, the, it can be a real experiment in the lab, or it can be a thought experiment, or it can be a simulation. 
Then we analyze the data and the collected data. We refine it. Uh, we we make certain trends. We build we build models to explain the observed data and predict the, predict the future data based on that model. And then we present it to our managers or professors or our teachers. This is what we do, and this is this is where the knowledge of uh, multidisciplinary comes into play. Uh, and then uh, I think uh, the road to road to the future, even if I, even if I want to work in the artificial intelligence or blockchain technologies or uh, uh, big data, I need to understand. Uh, I need to know uh, the basics of uh, data, how it is generated, how it can be refined, how it can be validated. And what is the variability in the data that which, which gives? Uh, so I need to have a, a full understanding of the data to build my bot, uh, models and then work on that one. And it does not have. To, I don't. I don't have to be a, belong to a single field, but I need to have knowledge. So that's uh, actually uh, encouraging for us. So I can I can stop over here. And uh, that, uh, so I started with the artificial intelligence. The artificial intelligence depends on uh, computing power and the big data which, with which it, uh, the computers play uh, so that decision can be made. And the computing power came all from the computers which has got a basic component transistor fabricated for amplifying a signal and then being used for uh, logic for computers. And the more number of large number of and transistors on a chip means more computing power. So right now we have we are coming into age where actually we are getting into a com quantum computing, which I did not mention, but smaller the gate length, then there are other uh, problems or issues that come in into play, which I did not mention. Uh, energy consumption is one parameter. Quantum interference is another parameter that is leading us to quantum computers <clears throat> where physicists and technologists have to have a bigger role to play to develop a com quantum computer. And then uh, the computing power based on, on these uh, microprocessor chips which, uh, uh, and then the big data which these uh, computers can play, how this data is generated, uh, in which areas it is uh, generated. Uh, it is not limited to one area. It is uh, in all areas, this data is available. Uh, one has to have the skill. And I, I, I tell my students, the computer programming is now is a skill. It's not a field. If you want to progress, you, you must know how to write a code, how to play with the uh, with your data, whether you get it in any discipline in physics, mathematics, chemistry, biology, uh, engineering, medicine, social science, you need to understand the data and play with that one. So uh, I say thank you very much. I hope uh, I have uh, uh, conveyed the message uh, and I'm open to questions, please. Thank you so very much, sir, for such a fascinating talk. Uh, so we have quite a lot of questions lined up. So um, I'll just start. Um, uh, the first question is from uh, Ms. Farah Nadeem. Uh, Farah, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Dr. Amla, and thank you, Dr. Asha. It's a very um, good talk. So my question is in regards to um, the environmental impact that people have now started looking at because, you know, let's say you train a large language model so it's not just you know you spend you need about two hundred thousand dollars or five hundred thousand dollars worth of compute but with that also comes the environmental impact for example um if this training is being done in a data center you know there is a carbon emission that is contributing water that's being used um, the heat that is generating um, and people have started looking at this um, this area now so i wanted to get your thoughts on um on what do you think are the things we should keep in mind when it comes to the trade-offs between, you know, yes, having lots and lots of compute, um, but then the, the downstream environmental climate impacts of using that compute. 
Um, so, so it'd be good to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. It's it's a very valid question. I tell you, <clears throat> I I have experience of CERN, which is a, a particle accelerator in Geneva, and uh, so I worked there for on on a project, uh, and uh, they need large computation power, and they cannot get they could not afford it at CERN, and they had the same issue. The First, first and the foremost was the energy issue. Uh, these computing machines, they need a lot of energy. And then uh, second is this, uh, where you, you, you put in a lot of energy, then the carbon emission becomes an issue. So the, what they came around with this problem was to have distributed computing. So they, what they did was they made partners all over the world. So, and they divided it into segments. So. So the, all the computing was uh, given, uh, was uh, distributed all over the world, all to all their partners from USA to Japan, to Australia, and they were working over there. And you know that every country has got its carbon emission uh, quota. And then, so this way they overcame this problem of energy and uh, carbon emission. For countries like Pakistan, uh, what I see is, it's a huge investment of uh, developing these, making these data centers. Uh, to me, I have come to know there are only two or three data centers in Pakistan right now, uh, which which uh, which are tier three data centers where we can do this work. But then I think we we should take advantage of uh, cloud computing, which is uh, available. And then this cloud cloud computing is again uh, distributed computing. Uh, Google or uh, Amazon, they are web services, they are offering their uh, servers to, to, do, to do this uh, artificial intelligence or, or you, uh, you can use their machines to test your models. Uh, and I, I, I know that uh, some of the uh, groups in Pakistan, they, they, have, they are already registered with them uh, with limited access. Recently, the uh, government of Pakistan approved a big project uh, to overcome this problem, uh, which will not actually have the data center here, but they, they are going to encourage the scientists working in artificial intelligence to use uh, those uh, cloud computing services available through third party like Amazon or Google or uh, IBM. So that's that's one way of overcoming it. But my, my perspective is, uh, we are a developing country. We need to have certain base. So, and we still, we are still very good uh, in terms of environment. Our carbon emission is not that uh, bad. Actually, we are, we, we, our carbon emission is uh, below, below the, uh, uh, what the normal with, with UN guideline gives. So we can take risk over there. The only issue is we don't have money to make those uh, data centers where we can do this this kind of work. Thank Is you. Is that so fine? Much. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so very much, sir. We have one more question from Dr. Mia Bachasap. Sir, please go ahead. Um, I can. Hello, I can uh, why is Hello. So yeah, um, sir. Actually, uh, I do not have the computer background, but uh, normally I sit along with my friends, especially in other departmental uh, colleagues. You know, so they are doing some uh, researches on nanotechnology, and some are some are having computer background. But just a commoner, I am asking you this question: that how AI is uh, tackling the problem of for nano um, technology, sir. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Let me say, uh, the Bell Lab is using AI to develop new materials. So we know what kind of materials we want. So there, there's, let me say one thing. There is one big project going on uh, to uh, hypothesize to for, to uh, to uh, to uh, I, I should not say fabricate to synthesize to synthesize materials with uh, certain properties 
it's like a genome project. We, we call this materials genome project, which means we give the properties to the computer that we want a material with this kind of properties, like the strength should be like that. It's a reactivity within, uh, with outside world should be like that. And then the AI uses its models and looks into the materials and its properties. And this AI is actually giving back the response in terms of this, this material can be made using the composition of the material which you want, which can be synthesized, should have these components in there. So that's one, one area it is working. Now the Bell Labs made a full automated uh, lab using the AI where they can synthesize those materials. So if a human body, human person, if I'm working the lab can synthesize a material, one material per day, but then the A use of the AIs and automated uh, machines, the Bell Labs is producing tens of materials a day. So the speed has gone up because of the use of this AI. So AI is being used to uh, hypothetically propose materials with specific properties. Right now, what we are doing, if there, is, there was no AI, we are, we were, what we we're doing is we take a material, we change its composition, we change the processing parameters, and then we look at the properties. So AI is helping the other way around. AI takes the properties and then looks what kind of material it should be, so which, 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 which should be synthesized to have these properties. Here the AI is helping, and big labs have already started taking advantage of that one. Uh, I can I can I can later on I can pass you uh, reference of this one. You can go and look at that lab uh, on their website. Thank okay. you very much, sir. So, with your permission, can we take one more question, please? Sure, 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 sure. Okay. So, Kurutulan Gul uh, wants to ask a question. Kurutulan, please go ahead. Uh, thank you so much, Amla. And uh, thank you, Dr. Ashit, for such a, uh, I would say, inciting uh, lecture. Uh, my question is about uh, the difference between data analytics and data sciences. Both of these terms, they are interchangeably used. Yes, of course. Of course. There of course. should be some you know, key differences. So I just want to know about those. Thank you so uh, much. I, I, can, I can only tell you from uh, my own experience. Okay. So I, I feel data analytics is a subset of data science for data analytics one data science actually is the, you have the data no matter it is a structured data or unstructured data it is giving you a pattern or not pattern so it encompasses everything but data analytics comes to the point where we have some form of a structured data already available and then we do some kind of analytics on it we we put some uh, equations some formulas some models to play with that data so I, I i my personal understanding is that data analytics is a subset of data science is that fine i guess it is sir. thank you so very much so may i ask just one question sir um from your presentation and things about the new inventions and discoveries and where the whole research uh, is going on where do you see pakistan in all this uh, scenario that it seems like we are really behind and what are the steps we can take um, to at least catch up uh, with uh, uh, with the current technologies and and, and, and the trends uh, I think this this question you should should be putting up to some people working in the planning department, Ministry of Planning and Development of Pakistan. That's right. Sir. Okay. So um, you know, if if you look at the personal wise, person wise, we sir. have many many stars in every field. Sure. So unfortunately, we don't have any coherence among them. Yeah. And secondly, what I feel from my own experience in in the universities. Uh, uh, the world realized after the Second World War, it we have to collaborate, and if we yes, don't sir. collaborate, we will not progress. And the the one biggest example which I give is uh, this CERN lab uh, in Geneva, particle physicists. 
they they started with nuclear physics or the particle physics if you now go there uh, they they have biologists working them chemists working for them engineers technicians physicists you name any area they are working together and they are from all over the world 27 23 or 27 european countries and then rest north north and south america australia asians they are all there working together if we have to achieve something we have to put our university our department at the back and we have to collaborate and we have to work together unfortunately last 20 years or so but i've seen that if some gov government announces some scheme for funding we all start competing against each other and then this does this actually does not help us so we need to come out of this one and then we can we can progress and secondly is uh, there is no i i very strongly feel uh, we have to have something a consistent policy how much money we are going to put into science and technology the base money it should be there uh, which every year we are, we become skeptical whether we are going to get money or not to run our labs to run our projects uh, that's uh, a key issue in in pakistan is the inconsistency in funding for research sir thank you so very much for your time and thank you so very much for for this interesting and and such a uh, insightful talk so thank you so very much i hope we'll hear from you again soon thank you thank you very much thank you everyone so thank you very much thanks thank you thank you very much and thank you everyone um uh, just wanted to say something um that we have uh, the last of our webinar uh, from the series at 4:30 uh, we have our uh, Vice Chancellor of Kosari University, Mary, Professor Dr. Habib Bukhari, and we have uh, another guest speaker, uh, Dr. Muhammad Baba. So kindly uh, join me back at 4.30, please. Thank you so very much.